A large portion of Professor Wayne Derman's introduction to his inaugural lecture was spent acknowledging the team he's worked with through the years. This light-hearted and entertaining inaugural lecture titled Broken Hearts, Wattle Tree, Spaceman and a Man with One Leg, My Extraordinary Journey in Medicine was delivered at the Sports Science Institute of South Africa on the 5th of October. Get the most important part of this inaugural over with first and that is really to express my gratitude to a lot of very, very important people in my life. And first and foremost, uh, my family. Uh, this is Rain and Shannon and David and Josh. <laughs> Photoshopped rather poorly into the picture. <laughs> and if you have a look, there's Dixie and Sadie in here as well. And this is Nadine. And these are my key people. How can I say thank you to them? It's a very, very difficult thing to do. But these are my nourishment, my support, and my life force. And without them, there is that there are three things that Tim has taught me. Tim taught me that it's okay to say that I don't know. The first person ever in medicine to say, you know what, it's fine to say you don't know. <coughs> the second thing is he showed me remarkable generosity. In fact, Tim is one of the most generous men that I know. Generous with absolutely everything from his ideas to his time. He's incredibly generous. And third is his leadership style. Tim has never ever said to me, nor anybody else that I can recall, you can't do this or you can't do that. It's like if you're going to say, I would like to study this or that, then that's fine. Go ahead and study this. So Tim, thank you so much for the role that you've played for me. Derman is currently the Professor of Sports and Exercise Medicine at UCT Sports Science Institute of South Africa. He has provided important clinical support to South Africa's athletes at international level as Chief Medical Officer for the South African team to the Sydney 2000 and Athens 2004 Olympic Games. Derman systematically unpacked the lecture by speaking to each of the following terms. Broken hearts, wattle trees, spacemen and the man with one leg. And we were interested at that stage in um, really challenging the beliefs that people who were sick needed to rest. And we started looking at people exercising in a, a, a program that Tim had started. And we found out that if you people who were in heart failure, and you look at their heart function, you get, get in the spectrum of cardiac failure, people who have got very, very poorly functioning hearts, and some with better functioning hearts. But the person who's got a poor functioning heart he could exercise much harder than the person with a better functioning heart who could only exercise a little bit. So we knew that it wasn't the heart that was regulating exercise performance. So we started looking at the skeletal muscle. And this is a biopsy taken from somebody who's normal, a control subject. And here's the biopsy looking at the same muscle area from somebody who's sick with heart failure. And you can see that that, that looks like completely different muscle. The muscle is big and small. And and if you have a look at this picture here, you'll see there's some fibers that are moth-eaten. And we worked together with Red Cross Children's Hospital to put together a scoring system whereby we could grade how badly this muscle was affected. And we learned that it was actually more of the damage of the muscle that affected these people rather than the pump function of the heart. So the next step was to actually put these patients through exercise training. And before they started training, there was a whole group of them that went through cardiac transplantation. And again, we were absolutely amazed that you put a new heart in, this is the ejection fraction, after heart transplant. This is a couple of weeks after the heart transplant. You'll see the ejection fraction has gone up to the same as the control. So the heart is kind of, all intents and purposes, working really well. But they still exercise intolerant. And this is the exercise performance here. And you can see it's not that much change. But if you <coughs> exercise train these individuals, not only does the exercise performance increase significantly, but the muscle repairs as well. So these were one of the, the, the some of the early studies that we did that really, really got us thinking. The next section is the wattle trees. And the wattle tree, I mean you might think, where on earth does he get a wattle tree from? Well, you get them from Australia. This is the uh, tree that produces the most amount of allergy in Australia. <laughs> and why I'm going to speak about the wattle tree, um, 
is, is really because of this slide. And this was uh, when I was first appointed uh, Chief Medical Officer to the Olympic team in 2000. Uh, we were traveling to uh, Australia. And um, I thought, OK, well, let me do what I can in form of research. Let me just document what it is that I'm actually seeing with these athletes. And this is uh, for two Olympic Games, the Athens in 2004 and the Black uh, Lions are in Sydney in 2000. And these are all the different uh, systems in the body. And down here at the, bot the bottom is acute injury and chronic injury. And really, at that time still, sports medicine was focused on injury. Everybody said, well, you've got to, got to focus down here. But if you go and add up all of these bars here and compare them to injury, we will soon see that the medical side, the medical conditions are as important as injuries are. And not only that, there are two areas, the respiratory and the ear, nose and throat system, but if you put them together, they become the single most important system. <coughs> so we documented this and we've continued working on this to actually still see why is it so important, is it so important that the respiratory system is the big bad guy. And this is uh, in looking at our athletes with disabilities in Sydney 2000, Beijing 2008, and 2011 World Championships. And just look at the respiratory illness here. In fact, it's about 44 incidents per 1,000 uh, patient, uh, patient deaths. Now that's a lot. That's much more in the disabilities. And we think that's due to uh, <coughs> patients with cerebral palsy. So I think it's cerebral palsy and spinal cord injury because the immune system is low. You know that respiratory illness for us might be trivial, but for this athlete here to have a rhinitis or an allergic system in the nose uh, is a major problem and a lot of the medication that one can use to actually treat them is also an issue. So from a lot of the work we were doing with two oceans uh, athletes, we had a feeling that this was not infected for a variety of different reasons that I can't go into now. Which led us to actually say, well, there has to be some other explanation for this. And with the Olympic Games going to be in springtime in Australia, and the wattle trees all around that, we decided uh, we are going to be clever. And colleagues at, at Di Howarden and the uh, colleagues at the Lung Institute organized for us to fly over allergens from Australia to actually test with the Olympic athletes going over before they got there. And we very clever, got over the wattle and all these different uh, uh, antigens. And we did skin prick testing on the group. And we were absolutely amazed to find that the percentage of atopy in the Olympic athletes was nearly double that of the normal population. More than half of the athletes in the Olympic squad are atopic. And the really interesting thing is that if you have a look at the wattle tree and the Australian pollens, they are way down on the list. So it wasn't those trees that were going to cause a problem. These guys up here were going to cause a problem. And these are the normal varieties of grass and the house dust mark, which is really, really very interesting, which means they are just very, very allergic individuals. And we now think that this is due to the effect of exercise at high intensity, that it actually switches on your immune system in a certain way. We did a number of uh, other studies that also I'm not going to go into much detail on these, but really sophisticated so, uh, studies involve, involving blood samples and nasal and pharyngeal swabs for viral cultures and bacterial cultures. And to date, we haven't been able to grow a single pathogen or organism that one can really identify that this is the infection that we're actually seeing. The, the translation of this work is that uh, when um, uh, Martin went to um, represent South Africa at the IOC for the, the uh, formulation of the uh, pre periodic health assessment for athletes, our contribution was that the respiratory illnesses were recognized and now included and skin prick testing was strongly suggested for all elite athletes to undergo. Uh, and really, this was a big swap around from the focus which had been on sudden death and asthma in this periodic health assessment to now look more wider uh, at the body. To the spacemen. And um, you all, all know Mark Shuttleworth, uh, who sold his company for 3.2 billion South African Rand. Um, 
to an American company and he chose to uh, invest 20 million to go up to the uh, space station. And he phoned me one day from Russia and he said, hi, when's Mark Shuttleworth? And I said, hey, Martin, how's it going? Uh, I'm having a total time with the Russians. Um, <coughs> sticking needles and doing all kinds of things to me. I really would like a South African doctor to come down. So I really, I've come back from the Olympic Games. Can't do it. He said, listen, please just come and meet with me here. There'll be a ticket on the desk tomorrow. Just let's have a meeting. And I flew to Moscow to meet with him. And he was very clever because what he did is he took me straight from the airport to this area here, which was Yuri Gagarin's locker. And he said, here you witness history. And some of the training is absolutely horrific which does push the body to the limit. This is the, to how you get used to space motion sickness. This is called the vestibular chair, or also called the vomit chair. And I mean, essentially what happens is it's got a motor that actually turns that chair around at 60 revolutions per minute. And they, they strap you in here, and you've got to throw your head side to side like this to really shake those in the ears around. And you strap in, and they place a KGB agent there to make sure... <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> You know that when we first did this, it wasn't 30 seconds before he became violently ill, but actually the night before the rocket was launched, he was able to make 17 minutes, throwing his head in all directions, <coughs> able to push that limit and actually extend it. And this is the world's largest centrifuge, 30 meters diameter. This is the world, the, the best Pratunga Junction ride you'll ever go in. <laughs> Not only does it actually turn around like this to recreate the forces of gravity, but actually you strap the cosmonaut into this thing and this rotates on this axis as well. Okay. Now, one of the best parts about being South African is innately we are very, very competitive. So, um, when Roberto and Yuri were able to make about eight minutes of this test, they said to him, ah, 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 come now, would he? he says, you've got to show them what you made of. And he says, okay, listen, uh, Bob, load me in there. Because what happens is everybody watches everybody else's test from a little observation room. And you can actually see when the guys are getting sick. And you can see when they're getting pushed that button to stop. And they said to him, listen, what happens is when you're going and you've surpassed these other guys' time, I'll let you know. And then, because they've got the camera, and they've got the headphones on, and then uh, you'll hear what we're going to do. So he says, I'm booked for this, load me up. So this test starts off, and he starts going 3G, 4G, 5G, 6G, and he surpasses the other two. And I say into the microphone, OK, put your chlom lach, no chlom lach, chlom lach. He breaks out into a huge smile, much to the horror of the both But he forgets at 6G, if you smile, you can't get your lips back on you. My colleagues that I went with, uh, Torrance Sherwood and Laura Kittel and myself, we, we did a lot of training uh, with Mark. And we used the best methods that we know how to actually train his muscle eccentrically so that we're going to prepare it for the harsh reality of space. And you know that despite everything that we did, he still managed to lose two kilograms of skeletal muscle mass in there after 10 days. So that really shows how, how uh, difficult the um, uh, environment it is. Now, um, this, uh, this is really the only way that human beings can actually recreate uh, zero gravity. And um, the best part of this is we all got to do this training with more. My core passion, and it's something that's uh, stirred inside me quite substantially, and I really um, want to give some of this passion that I have uh, for the disability sports to you. And I start this with showing you Usain Bolt, and I've used Usain, I could have used any of you. That this is the role model that actually we accept as the quintessential athlete. This is what a high performance athlete is meant to look like. And over the years, what has, what has happened to me, and I know it's happened to a, a number of my colleagues as well, is we've become jaundiced. And uh, we've like questioned this and said, well, you know, is this all about the three M's? Is it money and media and medicines that drive this? And actually, um, my enthusiasm for high performance sport has drifted from this and has actually now been rekindled 
by my involvement with the high performance uh, Paralympic athletes. And I show you Suzanne Ferreira, where there's this pocket of excellence that exists at Stellenbosch University, you know, 50 kilometers from us here, where she coaches this group of Paralympians that was taken in, in Beijing, multiple gold medal winners. This pocket of excellence is probably the center in South Africa that is really driving our Paralympic medals and our medal school. And I've been very, very fortunate to be involved with Suzanne in looking after these podium athletes from Beijing now in the build up to London. And this team has grown to 11, 11 athletes. And I really want to share some of the observations that I have with some of the athletes of this, with disabilities uh, from Beijing. The first is transcendence. And I'll show you Anu Furi, and I thank him for allowing me to use his clinical material. Anu came to me after we had arrived in Beijing and uh, after two days he said to me, Doc, I've got a problem. Pushing out of my blocks today, I can go in the back of my leg here and it's so sore now I can't touch that. And I examine him and I can't I can't I can't feel it. It's, uh, everything is sore at the back there. And I put him in an MRI scan. I'm going to show you the MRI from the publication that was <coughs> written from uh, this case series. And this is the legs over here and you can see that the normal tissue is gray, and you can see this white area here. This is a 10 by 3 centimeter skeletal muscle tear. Wow. And I sent it to Richard de Villiers, and he sends it to me an email back saying, Wayne, I'm so sorry that this guy has to come home. <coughs> Only thing is, Onu didn't come home. He ran the fourth fastest time in the world in a personal best three days after having this injury. And that wasn't all. There was a similar case where again we describe it in the MRI shown in, in a different page of this article of David Ruiz. And David didn't go home either. He jumped a personal best earning a silver medal uh, for South Africa in that time. The average time in the literature to repair where a person can even think of getting back to rehabilitation is 17 days. These guys did medal winning performances in three or four days after these injuries were sustained. And I've never seen this in 20 years of sports medicine. This happens to one of the spring box or the stormers that are on the next plane. But these, some of these athletes are able to achieve this. My second observation is something called acceptance and integration. And I'll show you some of our athletes on the floor of Hong Kong airport. And it reminds me to tell you, disability never ever sleeps. It's there when you go to sleep at night, and it's there when you wake up in the morning again. A 14-hour plane ride from Johannesburg to Hong Kong turns into a 16-hour ordeal for some of these athletes because you're severely disabled, you've loaded into the plane one hour before everybody else, you leave the plane one hour after everybody else, and if you're transiting to a Beijing, then it happens again. And I think what happens is that actually, if you accept so let me backtrack. This is a at Hong Kong airport, was in transit, and they're tired and hungry, and have to take themselves to the toilet. Do you think I hear one iota of any complaint? Not one peep. There are no prima donnas in this team. And I think how it works is that if you can accept maybe some of the toughest hands that life has to deal with, to you and truly able to integrate that into your being, then the gift you're given is one of perspective and you're able to see the big picture. That's my third observation and that the third component is resilience and the key to it is humor because it's not just any humor, it's self-deprecating humor. And what happens is that when you're able to, to laugh at yourself, you kind of remove the ego from the picture and you're able to really engage in that present moment. And for me, it's not only in one aspect of that makes us human, which is the physical, it's the mental, and it's the spiritual and emotional side as well. And we're all like one of these shoes individually. We go on the sliding scale and it's actually, in some instances, a choice every day where we want to function. Ability, or just, I've seen some physically brilliant specimens being totally disabled. And I've shown you these athletes with disabilities being fantastically able. So I come back to uh, Usain Bolt. 
And I'll show you some different role models because these role models are also pushing the limits. And if you don't believe me, just look at the data. Here are the heart rate data for severely impaired athletes with cerebral palsy playing a game called botcha. And this athlete is using his head to push this ball down to get it right next to another ball. It's like a game of balls. But just look at the peak heart rate. His heart rate is going as high as Usain Bolt's probably was. And look, it's extended over a period of 53 minutes, 46 minutes, and 57 minutes in the final. And the final is the highest heart rates of all. So our model changes. And certainly my model of sporting excellence changes. And there's a whole debate in the Paralympic movement if they should take out that word inspirational. But I find this inspirational. I find this athlete inspirational. Just look at the look on her face. And you realize that sport is primarily it's an emotional thing. And we see our own emotions mirrored in these athletes. Happiness, joy, sadness, transcendence. And then I think what does it for me is that I actually see and feel alive when I'm with these athletes. Because through hard work and just daily life, you become blunt. And this really awakens the spirit again. So, in conclusion, <laughs> as one gets older, you start asking questions about if your work is relevant and what legacy you're going to leave. And I'm really happy to see some of the patients sitting that we have from our programs in the audience. You want to be relevant. You want to be relevant on an individual level. You want to be relevant as a group level, country level, international level. And for Stan, who's one of our patients, he had a heart transplant and three years after the heart transplant, he was representing South Africa as an upstand here this evening. But I certainly know that Naomi is here this evening <coughs> and some of these other patients who for them the program is very, very relevant. 